Good evening. Uh, we'll go start the program now. I'm, I'm Mike Perry. I'm the president of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, a component of the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The center is the Army's premier research facility with an unrivaled collection of artifacts, manuscript collections, photo collections, and a superb research library that you can find no one else in the country. Uh, tonight, we are very pleased to have Tyler Bamford, who holds a doctorate in history from Temple University. He received a, the Beneke Scholarship in 2011, a re research fellowship at the U.S. Army Heritage Center Foundation in 2015, and was the inaugural Sherry and Alan Leventhal Research Fellow at the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy at the National World War II Museum. He is currently a historian with the U.S. Navy uh, Navy Historical and Heritage Command in Washington, D.C. His works have been featured in the Journal of Army History and the edited volume of Defense Engagements since 1900, Global Lessons in Soft Power, published by the University of Kansas in 2020. Dr. Bamford's first book and subject of his lecture tonight is entitled Forging the Anglo-American Alliance, the British and American Armies, 1917 to 1941. His book currently isn't published yet. It's coming out this summer but you can pre-order it uh, at the University of Kansas Press or on Amazon. Uh, I would ask that you hold your questions to the end and you use the question icon um, indicator uh, on your screen. Dr. Bamford, the floor is now yours. Thank you for the introduction, Mike. And I wanna thank the Army Heritage Center Foundation for inviting me to give this talk and for supporting the research I conducted at the Army Heritage and Education Center's archives on the topic of Anglo-American relations. Thank you also to everyone tuning in this evening. Tonight, I'm going to speak about my new book, Forging the Anglo-American Alliance, the British and American Armies, 1917 to 1941, which I began researching because of my interest in the role that Army officers play in what is now commonly referred to as defense diplomacy. My work seeks to explain how the Anglo-American alliance formed so quickly once the United States entered World War II and how the forces of the two nations operated so effectively during that war. What I found is that the extensive interactions between U.S. and British Army officers during World War I and the interwar period laid the foundation for their nation's military alliance in World War II. Cooperation between British and US officers in the First World War gave both armies a great deal of institutional knowledge about each other and the conduct of combined operations. Following the armistice that ended the conflict in 1918, the two armies continued to fight together in Russia and occupied Germany in adjacent zones of occupation. After the withdrawal of American soldiers from Europe in 1923, British and US Army officers still enjoyed a great deal of latitude when interacting with one another. They readily shared intelligence about perceived common threats and exchanged ideas about military technologies and tactics. Men from the two groups frequently socialized in imperial outposts around the world, and as a result, they developed an attitude of widespread mutual respect for each other's organizations by the late 1930s. The result of the officers' interactions during World War I and the interwar period was that when the US government decided to more overtly aid the British in their fight against Nazi Germany in 1940 and 1941, the British and US armies were able to build a formal alliance much more rapidly than they might otherwise have been able to do. Although the Anglo-American alliance at times was plagued by major disagreements and difficulties, it would not be an exaggeration to declare the two nations' cooperation in World War II probably the closest and most effective alliance between two sovereign nations in the 20th century. And their armies, as the two biggest services in each nation, wielded a powerful influence on the conduct of the war. On November 8, 1942, less than one year after the United States entered World War II, the United States and Great Britain launched Operation Torch, the ultimately successful amphibious invasion of North Africa and the beginning of the Allied campaign to wrest control of the Mediterranean from the Axis powers. Subsequent Anglo-American operations uh, decisively defeated all Axis forces in Western Europe in just 30 months, while the nation simultaneously conducted campaigns across Asia and the Pacific. Now, most histories of the alliance begin in 1939 when British leaders began courting U.S. public opinion, or in 1941 with the United States Lend-Lease Aid to Britain and the first full-scale staff talks between the two nations' chiefs of staff. But the speed with which the alliance was constituted after the outbreak of the war in Europe 
the unprecedented integration of the two nations' strategies and military commands, and their ultimate battlefield effectiveness cannot be explained by looking exclusively at diplomatic and military staff talks that occurred after the war had begun. More than just the relationship between Prime Minister Winston Churchill and President Franklin Roosevelt, the alliance required the cooperation of thousands of officers in both nations' militaries. My book reflects historians' recent interest in the role of personal connections in foreign relations, but my focus on the British and American armies departs from most existing literature that instead uses naval issues and the interactions of heads of state to characterize the whole relationship between the two nations. Indeed, it, the interest in naval issues has led most historians to conclude that the two armies had little meaningful contact between World War I and the start of World War II. Yet the roots of the Anglo-American alliance can be found in the positive interactions between officers of the US and British armies during World War I and in the two decades that followed. Aided by a similar strategic outlook and cultural similarities, British and American officers during and after World War I formed strong personal ties that sustained an informal military relationship in the interwar period, which laid the groundwork for their wartime cooperation between 1941 and 1945. Next slide, please. Before World War I, the U.S. and British armies had limited contact with each other, mostly in the form of observers in war zones, like the Russo-Japanese War, and in the brief Boxer Rebellion in China in 1900. General John Pershing, who served as the head of U.S. forces in Europe in World War I, had actually been an observer during the Russo-Japanese War, where he befriended several British observers that he encountered again uh, in World War I. After World War I began, Great Britain gave the U.S. military observers preferential access to the British Expeditionary Force in France while denying other nations like Japan the same privilege. When the United States entered the war in April 1917, British and, uh, Britain and France immediately dispatched military missions to Washington. Because the U.S. Army had less than 200,000 men under arms and would take nearly a year to field a sizable combat force, the Allies' initial suggestion for how the United States could help the Allied war effort was that the United States should send newly inducted men overseas so that the Allies could train them and incorporate them into their own armies. This plan was called amalgamation, and U.S. leaders promptly rejected it out of hand, uh, though the Allies kept pressing for it in one form or another, even after U.S. units had proven themselves on the battlefield in France. Next slide, please. The U.S. Army, however, uh, did accept British offers to send advisors to help instruct soldiers in training in the United States and overseas. Once in Europe, U.S. soldiers often completed additional, additional specialized training at British and French-run training camps, so that by the end of the war, more than 250,000 U.S. troops had trained with the British, and two infantry divisions, the 27th and 30th, fought with the British Expeditionary Forces until the end of the war. Yet most Doughboys' experience with the British lasted only a few weeks, and far more Americans spent time training with French units. This was fortunate because disagreements often developed among United States and British enlisted men, especially when the U.S. soldiers were immigrants or the children of immigrants who had no English ancestry. On the other hand, U.S. and Brit British Army officers got along much better with one another and formed fast friendships, which was not surprising for individuals in the same profession. U.S. officers often found much to admire in the British Army's organization and combat record. When the U.S. Army took over its own part of the front in France, the British were very disappointed that the American sector was bordered by French units on both sides. But the extended time that U.S. soldiers spent with the French did not lead to stronger relations, and it is interesting to compare the generally poorer American relations with the French Army uh, than with their friendlier attitudes towards the British. The time that U.S. officers spent serving in close proximity to French units in France caused constant disagreements between the two groups. To begin with, the Americans faced constant delays in procuring supplies and transportation in France. There were also difficulties obtaining permission to build the necessary facilities to house and train their army in France as a result of French uh, regulations and bureaucracy. One U.S. officer reported that the French bureaucracy often slowed down U.S. progress, and then French officers added to Americans' frustrations by complaining that the Americans were moving too slow. Then there was the U.S. Army's difficulty with Supreme Allied Commander Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who often dismissed American suggestions. Finally, the French regularly assumed a condescending attitude toward Americans, whom they viewed as inexperienced. 
U.S. officers felt that this was unjustified because the French army they observed late in the war did not patrol aggressively and had low morale, which resulted in widespread mutinies in early 1917 involving as many as 40,000 French soldiers. The result of U.S. officers' extended experience with the French army was that many Americans' reports and post-war memoirs contained unfavorable opinions of the French army and favorable assessments of the British. The U.S. Army's experience with, experiences with the British and French left a lasting impression, even for soldiers who did not serve overseas during the war. Officers who had served in France passed on their impressions to colleagues through lectures at the Army War College, uh, through their memoirs, and casual conversations. General Fox Connor was perhaps one of the most influential among these senior U.S. officers. He was the operations officer on Pershing's staff, uh, on, in the Allied Expeditionary, in the American Expeditionary Force, and gave an annual lecture at the Army War College about the lessons of coalition warfare and the need for a unified command in future alliances. Connor was a mentor to Major Dwight Eisenhower, who served uh, stateside in World War I, but Eisenhower later helped write an operational history of the war for the American Bo Battle Monuments Commission, and he also avidly read uh, other senior officers' memoirs, such as uh, Pershing's memoirs. Next slide, please. Following the armistice on November 11th, 1918, officers in the British and US armies continued to interact in the course of their official duties overseas. In Russia, soldiers from both armies fought together ostensibly to prevent shipments of allied war materials from falling into Bolshevik hands, but in reality to assist anti-Bolshevik forces in the Russian Civil War. 1,600 British troops and 5,500 US soldiers fought together around the Port of Archangel from July, 1918 until June of 1919. U.S. soldiers of the 339th Infantry Regiment and their supporting units actually fought under British command for this, the entirety of the campaign because the United States did not bring a, a, a higher command structure with them. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, both armies kept occupation forces in Germany until the United States withdrew in 1923. The United States occupation zone in Germany surrounded the city of Koblenz, and the British zone consisted of territory around the German city of Cologne. British and US officers inspected each other's troops, hosted sporting competitions, dined together and hunted together regularly. At the end of 1919, there were 45,000 British and 19,000 American soldiers in the occupation force on the Rhine. American soldiers were encouraged to visit England on leave and General Pershing was given the honor of leading the Allies victory parade in London on July 15, 1919. He was then celebrated with honorary degrees at several British universities before he sailed home later that month. Yet overall, Amer Anglo-American diplomatic relations deteriorated rapidly after the armistice and during the peace conference that followed. There were major disagreements disagreements between the United States and its allies over the provisions in the Treaty of Versailles. Americans thought that stripping Germany of territory and imposing war reparations was on Germany was an overly harsh um, way to go, but many Americans felt that this was uh, sowing the seeds of the next war. In addition, the British and French empires expanded immensely when they assumed control of colonies formerly controlled by Germany and its allies. This undermined the idea of making the world safe for democracy, which Americans had been told was the whole reason they were fighting in the war. These developments fostered bitterness among Americans who felt that the United States had been tricked into entering the war in order to protect the British Empire and protect US bankers' loans to the Allies. At the end of the war, Britain owed massive war debts to the United States, and although the United States negotiated lower settlements with other, other debtor countries like Italy, the United States wouldn't reduce the interest rate on, charge, on British loans uh, because that of that nation's assumed affluence. As a result, after 12 years of making payments on its $4.2 billion debt, Great Britain owed the United States more money than it had borrowed during the war. On top of these disputes, a naval arms race broke out between the United States, Great Britain, and Japan after World War I. The United States wanted a fleet second to none that would enable it to defend its trade following the experience of having U.S. ships seized by Great Britain and, and other belligerents in World War I. Britain's alliance with Japan was another point of contention for the United States because it seemed that the alliance could now only be aimed at countering the, United, the growth of the, the United States. It was little wonder then that the United States Navy saw the British Royal Navy as the most dangerous potential enemy and anti-British sentiment ran high in the United States, particularly among immigrant populations, such as those from Ireland. Amid this hostility, the friendly relations between the British and US armies stood in contrast 
to the contentious diplomatic relations between their two countries. Next slide, please. After US troops returned home from Europe, the primary links between the United States and British armies again became their military attaches. Attaches were often either lieutenant colonels or colonels who acted as official representatives of their forces in the country where they were assigned, usually for tours lasting between three to four years. These men gathered intelligence, then wrote reports on subjects that ranged from weapons technology and tactics to unit organizations, rates of pay, and even mundane topics like how military bands were organized. Attachés required, acquired most of their information from open sources, such as newspapers and journals, and much of the rest came from talking with officers of the host nation and vi visiting military installations. Large-scale army maneuvers offered another opportunity for intelligence gathering, and the British Army conducted some of the largest maneuvers of any nation in the 1920s. At these exercises, U.S. attachés were normally given more access than those of any other nation. And this was especially valuable for the American army because the, of the experimental mechanized force that Britain formed in the 1920s that tested large-scale tank formations and tank technology. The United States attaches got along easily with British officers, and as a result, they had great success in acquiring details on classified subjects, particularly tank technologies and chemical weapons. The United States Military Intelligence Division found this intelligence so valuable that Great Britain was the only nation where the United States Army stationed an assistant attache for many years, uh, even during the Great Depression, when budgets were extremely tight. British attaches received a similarly warm reception in Washington and traveled widely to visit U.S. military schools and bases. Colonel Claude, Claude Charlton alone visited 47 American states uh, during his tour of duty. Uh, British attaches often acquired more intelligence than they could evaluate because the United States Military Intelligence Division prided itself on promptly responding to their inquiries. As a result, the British attache repeatedly wrote to the War Office requesting additional assistance to process all of the information he was acquiring. British and U.S. military leaders occasionally ordered their attaches to arrange formal exchanges, but these arrangements often failed to materialize. In one case, the United States Army proposed an exchange of mobilization information uh, between itself and Great Britain in 1936, and Great Britain accepted the offer in the hope of strengthening relations with the United States, but the U.S. Army backed out of the exchange at the last moment because it had decided to rewrite its own mobilization plans and did not want to give the British uh, outdated information. The difficulty of, of arranging rec formal recurring exchanges meant that attaches relied instead upon informal exchanges and conversations along with open sources to write their reports. Far from hindering re the relationship, however, these methods provided both armies with nearly all the intelligence they desired. Next slide, please. The United States Military Intelligence Division highly valued the reports from its military attaches and it ensured a wide distribution of the reports among both training and operational commands. The commanders of branch schools requested copies of reports on subjects relevant to their missions, as did the Army War College, where students used the reports to write papers on topics such as British military educational institutions, British cavalry units, and the Territorial Army, which was Britain's equivalent of the U.S. National Guard. An indication of the importance of attaché reports on the British Army is evident in the fact that the Army War College requested more than twice as many reports about the British Army as it did on the Army of any other nation in the interwar period. The reason for the focus on Great Britain was that the United States and British armies had similar organizations, they both operated in democratic societies, and both dealt with similar problems like allocated, allocating limited budgets and manpower shortages. The United States Army, in fact, numbered just 112,000 men and officers in 1923 and rarely counted more than 150,000 men on its roster in the 1920s and 30s. Because both armies were reluctant to agree to binding formal exchanges, their intelligence ties were usually based on goodwill instead of mandated reciprocity. And these types of interactions, in turn, depended heavily on individual attaché skills at cultivating personal connections among foreign officers. Fortunately, these connections were made easier by the similar outlook and cultures within the two armies. Officers in both the British and U.S. Army were predominantly white, Protestant, and belonged to the middle and upper classes. Many had external, external sources of income and enjoyed pastimes like hunting and polo. In fact, officers from the two armies played a series of polo matches after an exchange of correspondence between their chiefs of staff. The first match was held in New York in 1923, and a second was later held in England as well as other shooting competitions between the two, two armies. 
Amid rapid social changes after World War I that included urbanization, mass consumerism, the growth of big business, and movements supporting pacifism and women's rights, the interwar routines of army officers on military bases in both nations changed very little. And as a result, they became more removed from popular culture and more similar to their foreign counterparts. The United States and British officers also shared a similar strategic outlook focused on defending their far-flung empires from external and internal threats. Imperial policing was the biggest interwar challenge for both armies. The US Army had a large presence in the Philippines, and Great Britain had large garrisons in India, Africa, and the Middle East, and both armies stationed troops in China. This too provided opportunities for collaboration, such as when the United States provided Britain with detailed maps of China before Britain dispatched troops there in 1927, or when the United States permitted British troops to rest in Hawaii on their, their way to China in 1929. Especially after the Russian Revolution, officers in both arm, armies monitored the threat of political radicals. American and British officers freely exchanged intelligence on the movements of Irish independence activists, but especially feared the Bolsheviks. Many officers in both armies thought they saw the influence of a global communist conspiracy in every worker strike or protest, even when protesters were former soldiers, uh, such as the, was the case during the bonus march on Washington in 1932. Now, owing to the similar outlooks and missions of the British and American uh, officers, they both viewed each other as partners and dismissed the possibility of a war between their nations, despite Great Britain being the biggest potential threat to US security because of its large Navy. Next slide, please. In an effort to promote goodwill between their countries, military attaches often took a broad view of their role beyond just intelligence gathering. After Charles Lindbergh's historic transatlantic solo flight in 1927, U.S. attaché in London, Colonel Kenyon Joyce, arranged for the famous flyer to visit London and meet the King and Queen. Lindbergh was greeted with massive cheering crowds, and the Royal Air Force even provided one of their newest fighter planes for him to test. The United States and British military partnership in this period was not replicated with other nations because of a number of factors. The Japanese military, for example, adhered to much stricter secrecy practices than other nations and carefully monitored the activities of foreign attachés on its soil. The German army was not permitted to station military attaches abroad at all until 1932, and even after it, it was uh, allowed to do so, its leaders dismissed the, the military capabilities of other nations. Similarly, the French army as well adopted an attitude of superiority and focused uh, its energies on preparing for a protracted land war instead of a rapid war of movement, uh, much differently than the British and American armies focus. Language, of course, was an important factor in the British and US Army's relations. One of the advantages of easy communication was that enabled, it enabled US military journals to easily reprint British military articles and British publications could do the same. Interwar British journals published several articles about mechanization by future General George Patton, among others. Exchanges of officers at military schools was limited by both armies in the interwar period, but the United States Army sent several soldiers each year to the British Army's Cavalry School through 1923. Despite the absence of official officer exchanges, 13 West Point graduates also went to Great Britain as Rhodes Scholars in the 1920s and 30s, and many of these, later, these men later became generals during World War II. U.S. military attaches supervised these students and often arranged for them to train with, the, with British Army units over academic breaks while they were in Great Britain. Thanks to the efforts of British and US officers, as well as to their similar strategic positions, the British and US armies were the most important foreign forces to each other until Germany publicly announced its rearmament in 1933. The British army was the best model for the US army and on the cutting edge of tank development. And the British army actively pursued friendly relations with the US army by sharing intelligence because British officers saw the United States as a natural ally against communism and revisionist powers such as Japan, despite isolationist US policies. After Hitler became the leader of Germany in 1933 and began rearming that country, his actions did not immediately prompt widespread alarm within the British military. A number of British officers, in fact, had sympathy for Germany and saw the Treaty of Versailles as being unfair. British leaders saw that Germany could once again become a threat, but they thought that this was years away given the, the French army's strength. Britain finally began to rearm in 1935 following Italy's invasion of Ethiopia in, uh, in October of that year, 
But Britain's primary focus was on strengthening its Navy and Air Force and not expanding its army. Many British strategists believed that sending a large army to France in World War I had been a mistake, and they saw their nation's contribution to any future wars being predominantly in the air and at sea. Only in the late 1930s did Britain acknowledge the need to begin forming another expeditionary force to fight on the continent. Nor did Britain hold staff talks with France until April of 1936, after Germany had decided to remilitarize the Rhineland. The British reluctance to cooperate with France stemmed from the desire to avoid antagonizing Germany or emboldening French, the French to be more aggressive. This meant that the British and French staff talks were little more than exchanges of codes and other technical information until 1939, when the two armies finally began formulating war policies. British political leaders in the late 1930s, meanwhile, looked to the United States exclusively as a source of arms. They did not expect to need U.S. intervention in any future war, and they especially could not hope for much action from the United States after Congress passed annual neutrality acts beginning in 1934 that limited Americans' ability to give loans or sell weapons to nations at war. These restrict restrictions stemmed from the bad memories Americans had of allegedly being drawn into World War I. Fortunately, the Neutrality Acts were revised in 1937 so that arms could be sold on a cash and carry basis, which benefited Great Britain with its large merchant fleet and navy. Great Britain primarily hoped that the United States would act as a check on Japan's ambitions in Asia, thereby protecting the British possessions of Hong Kong and Singapore. But isolationist sentiment in the United States meant that President Franklin Roosevelt could not give formal assurances to Great Britain. Most alarming to the British was the United States' unwillingness to spend large sums on defending the Philippines. The islands scheduled independence from the United States in 1946 threatened to cause a power vacuum since the new state would be incapable of defending itself against Japan. The United States Army and British officers in Asia, however, far from the centers of power in Washington and London, freely shared intelligence among themselves because they believed in the common cause of preserving the supremacy of the white races in Asia at the time. Next slide, please. After war broke out in Europe on September 1st, 1939, the United States military attache in London walked a tightrope as a representative of a neutral nation stationed in a country at war. The British Army, for its part, once again treated U.S. attaches better than those of other nations, just as it had in World War I. Even after Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered increased security to prevent leaks of classified information, the United States military attaché still had privileged access thanks to friends in the War Office who looked over his reports and corrected any inaccuracies. Most U.S. officers supported the Allied cause, but found themselves in a tough spot after France's surrender in May of 1940. United States officers wanted to aid Britain, but realized the severe deficiencies in their own service and were reluctant to send any arms to Great Britain, thereby weakening their own country's defenses. Based on assessments from U.S. military attaches that Great Britain would survive, however, President Roosevelt overrode these concerns and ordered the U.S. Army to declare large amounts of small arms, artillery, and ammunition as surplus so that it could be sold to Britain. This decision proved correct because the United States Army was able to rearm with newer weapons and use reports on British experiences in order to design new armaments. Roosevelt and Churchill both hindered military relations at other times because of their shared preference for personal diplomacy and micromanaging defense matters, which complicated their army's efforts at coordination and openness. Here again, military intelligence served as a convenient way around politicians meddling, and the military intelligence division in the United States sent the experienced attache Brigadier General Raymond Lee, who had previously served three years in Great Britain as an attache, back to London to serve as attache in 1940. Both Lee and his successor, Sherman Miles, later served as the head of the military intelligence division, which showed the importance of the London attache posting. Meanwhile, in 1940 and 1941, the United States public opinion was still deeply divided over U.S. intervention in the war. Though a Gallup poll showed that an overwhelming number favored an allied victory after the defeat of France, a growing majority of Americans favored sending military aid to Britain, even if it risked U.S. involvement in the war. Private organizations formed to lobby for aid to Britain, uh, and these organizations approached retired U.S. Generals John Pershing and Douglas MacArthur and asked them to speak in favor of aiding Britain, and both gave radio addresses calling for the United States to send arms uh, to the British, British as a result. Next slide, please. 
In July 1940, Britain sent its first military mission to coordinate arms purchases in the United States. The British officers could not convince US firms to manufacture British designs, unfortunately, because these companies feared that if they retooled to produce British weapons, then they might lose their investments and be left with, with uh, stocks of arms the United States Army would not buy if Britain surrendered as France had in June of 1940. But the United States Army was interested in input from these British officers on the designs for new weapons, and their extensive collaboration resulted in the development of the M3 medium tank. Britain eventually ordered 2,000 of these tanks from United States factories in 1940. It also placed orders for 42,000 aircraft engines by August of 1940. And these orders helped to jumpstart the United States economy and build out manufacturing capacity, which greatly aided the United States mobilization once it entered the war. The first secret talks involving Great Britain and the United States representatives uh, took place in August of 1940, but they were disappointing for the British Army because the United States uh, officers could make no commitments. Even so, the British still decided to share information about their plans and forced deployments with the, British, with the American officers. The United States also at this time continued to send large numbers of US military observers to Great Britain, so many in fact that the British Army reported to the Foreign Office at one point that it couldn't be sure how many American officers uh, were actually in Great Britain. British Army officers who spoke to these observers reported that they were all eager uh, for their country to join Great Britain in the fight against Germany. After President Franklin Roosevelt was re-elected for a third term in November of 1940, he felt much more comfort, confident overtly supporting Great Britain, even as the British position grew more desperate. When Churchill wrote to Roosevelt that Great Britain was out of cash to buy arms with, the president's allies in Congress passed the Lend-Lease Act by a wide margin in March of 1941. This bill empowered the president to give away vast amounts of military material while neatly avoiding the war debt issue that plagued Anglo-American relations after World War I. Next slide, please. The first high-level staff talks between the two nations took place on January 29, 1941. In these talks, the British revealed their war plans to the United States service chiefs. The military leaders of both nations then wrote and endorsed what they referred to as the ABC-1 agreement, which outlined the timeline for the actions the United States would take were it to enter the war. These actions included the first deployment of troops to Great Britain. The British Army had learned from its failure to build an effective alliance with the French in 1939. And as a result, in talks with the United States, British officers sought more integration and the establishment of, of a combined chiefs of staff. British officers were particularly careful not to talk down to United States officers or imply that US officers should follow their procedures as British, the British had sometimes suggested during World War I. Both nations agreed to concentrate on defeating Germany first and launching an initial operation in North Africa, though the United States Army had favored an early invasion of mainland Europe and a direct attack into Germany. In January of 1941, the United States and British armies also established former, formal military missions in London and Washington, respectively, that were intended to maintain contact between the armies and begin planning for the arrival of US troops uh, if and when the United States entered the war. Uh, these groups were called special observer groups to hide their, their true purpose because, again, the United States was still neutral at this time. Brit Britain, uh, the British debated, uh, but quickly decided to share nearly all intelligence they had with the United States Special Observer Group ahead of its arrival. In return, the U.S. Army Observer Reports accurately evaluated British strengths, like planning and morale, as well as the, the British weaknesses, like their equipment shortages in North Africa. In August of 1941, Roosevelt, Churchill, and their military chiefs met again in Placentia Bay, Newfoundland, at, the, at this conference, Churchill and Roosevelt agreed upon the Atlantic Charter that spelled out their post-war aims, while their military chiefs met to discuss war planning. American officers found British war plans optimistic, but thought the British were much better prepared than the United States in terms of coordination between their service branches. The British officers were still disappointed at the lack of any more formal commitments from the United States for entering the war, but they didn't have to wait long from, from this point. Next slide, please. Less than two months after the United States entered World War II following Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, 14,000 American soldiers had already arrived in Great Britain. Eventually, more than a million were stationed on the islands during the war. In January of 1942, the two nations established a combined chiefs of staff in Washington, 
This organization orchestrated their global war effort and even survived into the immediate post-war years. Officers from both armies applied the lessons they had learned from World War I when making key decisions in World War II. These lessons included the implementation of unified commands in the invasion of North Africa and subsequent operations, and both armies also made key concessions for the sake of the alliance. The British agreed that the Combined Chiefs of Staff would be located in Washington and agreed that a United States officer would be the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. In return, the United States Army ceded operational command in many campaigns to the British. British and American officers' interwar relations had given both armies a broad knowledge of each other's methods, culture, and personnel. Perhaps most importantly, it fostered a widespread feeling of mutual respect among officers. Leaders in both armies consequently went to great lengths to maintain good relations by issuing booklets on British culture to U.S. troops and creating whole departments charged with keeping harmony between British and U.S. soldiers. British Field Marshal Sir John Dill and U.S. General Dwight Eisenhower exemplified the Army's efforts to build strong wartime relations, but examples of officers who consci consciously worked toward this goal were not exclusively found among senior officers, but rather among those of all ranks. Perhaps the notable exceptions, such as General George Patton, proved the rule. In August of 1942, he wrote in his diary in North Africa how, quote, it is very noticeable that most of the that most of the American officers here are pro-British. I am not, how, however, not pro-British. Pro For all the alliance's attendant difficulties and disagreements, uh, it was a monumental achievement that required considerable initiative and commitment from thousands, from thousands of officers in both nations. The British and US armies were just one component of the alliance, but they played a central role in planning and leading its largest campaigns. And it was the two armies' close association in World War I that enabled them to create an informal defense relationship before World War II, which in turn formed the basis of the Anglo-American Wartime Alliance and the post-war defense partnership that remains a pillar of U.S. foreign policy to this day. Thank you. Okay, if anybody has questions, please use the question and answer icon, uh, and I'll pass them over to Tyler. Uh, Tyler, question, you talked about sports. Um, you talked about polo and, and stuff that maybe Americans might have uh, uh, participated in stateside. Did they uh, take on some of the more unique sports that uh, the British follow, cricket and, and such things, or did you find examples of us trying to learn that? I, I did not find examples of Americans trying to learn cricket. However, I, I do know of, of uh, several American officers who traveled to India. So it's, it's very conceivable that they might have tried it at some point or another. Uh, Americans did uh, also take, take part in a lot of uh, popular British uh, horse racing sports, uh, steeplechase and, and things like that too. Um, polo was just kind of uh, a very popular a sport among the upper classes at that time, you know, if, if you were wealthy enough to own a horse. And so uh, the American and British officers had to, to actually use their own mounts for these matches. So it really gives you an idea of the, the social class that they were coming from. Okay. Uh, this question is from Paul. He says, besides Patton, what other senior U.S. officers were known to display anti-British sentiments? That's a good, great question. Thanks so much, Paul. So there was uh, General Albert Wiedemeyer. Uh, he was in the, the War Plans Division uh, under, under Marshall for much of the war. Uh, he was very uh, skeptical of British motives for a lot of operations. Uh, there was also a, a military attache in Romania, and, and he was that far away from the British for good reason. But uh, his name was uh, Ratay, R-A-T-A-Y, uh, and he was a colonel for most of the war. He was also expressed very pro-Nazi sentiments at various times. So the, the American, uh, the 
the military intelligence division was kind of keen on keeping him away from the British as well. Um, and then there was General Embick, E-M-B-I-C-K, and he was also uh, General Albert Wiedemeyer's uh, father-in-law, I believe it was too. And he also expressed some, some suspicions of British motives. Uh, a lot of these officers, anti-British sentiments was kind of, they, they framed them in being suspicious of the United States Army being led into you know, campaigns that were merely to protect the, the power of the British Empire or recapture territories that would belong to the British Empire. And so Albert Wiedemeyer and his uh, memoirs after the war, he actually takes goes to, to great pains to say, I was never actually anti-British. I really respect the British and, and they respect me for the stands I took. Um, so he actually, the fact that he felt the need to clarify and then come out and say that, that, he, that he wasn't anti-British, but that he had taken you know, positions against them, against them actually, I think, shows that, that other people may have perceived his, his uh, opinions as being anti-British. I find it interesting. Uh, Paul came back and said Wiedemeyer was uh, also trained at the German Staff College. He was, he was the only American officer, in fact, that trained, trained over in Germany during the wars, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, did we have any officers trained with the French uh, Staff College? I don't know specifically about the Staff College, but there were a handful that, that trained over in France uh, at various times in the 20s. Yeah. Let's see, we got, uh, this is from Ellen. So outside the scope of the book's time period, did anyone on either side take up correspondence post-World War II with the men that made connections with? So did basically the relationships that they established during the war, you may not have looked at this. Yeah, yeah you know, it, I, I have no doubt that they did um, because it was it was pretty common after World War I. Um, well, I should say that, you know, not always did they did they maintain, you know, active correspondences either, but they would uh, they would actively try to meet up with one another for their vacation. So a lot of United States uh, British officers would travel uh, back and forth. And so they would let each other know that they were going to be in the country and they would schedule meetings. I have no doubt that, that some of them kept up correspondence after the war. Uh, and I, I think I can remember some occasions where they would send each other's memoirs to one another, you know, kind of re reminiscing about the war again. Uh, but I have not seen the actual correspondence between any of these senior officers. Um, uh, besides uh, um, Len Lease, did the British and American um, cooperate on any technological advances that you saw during the interwar war period? Oh, sure. You know, and, and, and this was in the book, but, you know, I didn't have time for it in the talk. But, um, oh, sorry, you, you, when you say the interwar period, right, so before, before the start of World War II, that, one, that one's trickier. There was no official coordination between technologies. And, and the, in fact, the, the British were able to keep one of their technologies, radar, um, secret entirely from, from most of the rest of the world until, um, until uh, Henry Tizard, uh, Sir Henry Tizard's mission shared a lot of these technologies with the United States in, in 1941, uh, 1940, I believe it was actually. Uh, but no, there was no, there was no technological coordination as such, as you kind of saw actually with the German and Russian military in secret in the 1920s. Um, but for the United States, it was mostly they were they were trying to 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 the United States was looking at what the the British military was doing in terms of tank technology to see if it was better than what they had and could they emulate it. Uh, some some tank companies in Great Britain, you know, they were eager to try and get you know contracts outside of that country. So if, if they they were hoping that they could share their technology, um, but I I know of no formal coordination between them. No. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Well, Tyler, oops. So we got uh, a chat, let me see, chat there. Um, he's gonna throw you out uh, and, and, and put you in the water. Someone wants to know about any cooperation between naval attaches. Naval attaches, right. So there was, a, there was, um, there were a lot of, a lot of uh, cooperation between naval attaches, especially in the late 1930s between the British and the Americans. Um, in fact, there's, there's a, a great book also out by Kansas called Tracking the Axis Enemy, I think, um, that, and also, you know, the United States was, was allowing British ships to be repaired in its own, in its ports um, before the United States officially entered the war. In terms of uh, the 20s and 30s, I, I suspect, but I've not looked at the correspondence, that the relations, you know, were tense at times because of uh, naval arms limitation agreements, but they were probably more friendly after 1930 uh, when the United States and Great Britain, you know, had, had resolved the cruiser issue. Before that, and this is why naval issues, you know, can't really stand as a, as a, a stand-in for the entire relationship, 
before 1930, there, there was a great deal of tenseness uh, in, uh, in the United States and Great Britain over naval issues, because even after the Washington Naval Conference in 1922, uh, some in Great Britain accused the United States of cheating the, the spirit of that agreement by building uh, more cruisers than, than they were you know, than they were supposed to, or rehabilitating older ships, then was, it was kind of the understanding that they wouldn't. Um, so, you know, I suspect that the naval relations would have been stronger at some points when army relations might have been not as strong and, and vice versa. And so that's why it's kind of important to look at them, you know, on their own terms. And, and there are several great, great studies that do that already. Uh, this is a question from Richard. Um, he talks about an, an earlier uh, presenter who talked about some of the development of the war plans in the interwar period where Britain was the dominant uh, threat and the war plans were developed against Britain. Mm -hmm. how, how much did Britain know about this and how uh, did this affect relationships between the army and the Navy? Because it was Brit British Navy that was considered the greatest threat. Yeah, so the Great Britain was kind of a useful foil for both the, Na the, the American Navy and the, the American Army in the interwar period. So the war plan you're talking about is War Plan Red, uh, which was, you know, the, the, the idea or the, the plan in which the United States, uh, which is usually referred to as blue in, in these designations, these color designations, uh, would wage war against Great Britain. And the, the war plans, they were an extremely useful exercise because for the United States, this fighting a war against Great Britain would require the maximum effort from its, both its Navy and its army, really, because, you know, the army would undertake an invasion of Canada, uh, unless that, that, you know, uh, Dominion declared its neutrality uh, for for you know for the entire interwar period. Basically, Great Britain had the largest navy, so it was it was a great exercise in that regard. I have not seen any documentation indicating that Great Britain knew about war uh, war plan red. However, part of that could be that the war office's uh, files from from their attaches in the interwar period were, to my knowledge, completely destroyed by the Luftwaffe in 1940. So that, that makes uh, research on that topic a bit difficult. But it, it's unlikely that they would have known about that. War plans would have been probably the, the area that were, was the most secret among you know, all of the intelligence that the, the United States possessed. They, they would publish, US journals even published details about the B-17 bomber when it was still in an experimental prototype stage, but they would never publish things about our war plans. Okay. So that was a great question though, thank you. Uh, this is another post-war question okay. about uh, resentment or attitudes by British officers at the number of uh, war brides taken home by uh, American soldiers? I mean, yes, there, there, there undoubtedly was some. Uh, I, I don't know how much it affected officers' relations in the army, but I mean, there, there undoubtedly was a, a great deal of tension you know, between the forces. Uh, I, I, I forget the number of war brides that were taken, but it's, it's thousands. Um, it's, it's a considerable number. In fact, I can, I've met people, friends who have, you know, grandparents that, that they were war brides. Um, I, I don't know of, of its souring relations. It might not have soured relations as much between officers because officers, would, they would have been a little bit older. They would have been a little bit wealthier. And so they might have already, you know, had, you know, families. They might not have been as acutely aware of, of you know, any shortage of women after the war. Um, yeah, but but it's very interesting. And, and there are, there are great, great studies on that topic as well. My, war, my mother was a war bride, but from, uh, from in Germany, so. There you go, you, you, you keep um, encountering them. I'm sorry, I'm gonna kill your name. Vishal, Vishal I can't pronounce, sorry. Um, one, he wants to know of any books that you recommend that cover the work of British and American defense attaches that really focuses on their works. Are there any books that you use in your research or the pre uh, preparation of your talk tonight? Sorry, what, what books on what topic again? Military attaches, attaches specifically. Okay, well, there, there's a recent, the, the, the recent edited volume I contributed call, to called Defense Engagement and since 1900. Uh, that is a, uh, a, a, a kind of a, a study from several different scholars about uh, the, the role of military attaches in, in defense engagement, um, mostly from a, a European and uh, American perspective. And there's also a book by Thomas Mankin, Uncovering Ways of War. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a slim volume that talks about the effectiveness of attaches at intelligence gathering, uh, American attaches specifically in Japan, Great Britain, uh, and Germany 
before World War II and how they were very successful at uncovering technologies that they were looking for and somewhat less successful if they did if it was a technology that they didn't know to look for, basically. But but those two books I, I would say uh, right now are the best ones about military attaches in recent scholarship. Okay, last uh, last call for questions. I don't see one pop up in the next several uh, seconds. I'll say, uh, uh, Tyler, you have any closing comments? I just want to thank everyone so much for, for coming out and listening to the talk tonight. And I, I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Well, thank you for, for agreeing to do this. We hope to see you back up this way uh, someday for research that the Navy doesn't totally skew you off to uh, uh, just, just to looking at maritime talk, topics. Um, I'd invite everybody to come back on April 6th uh, with Colonel Mark uh, Viney, who used to be a director here at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, is now an Army uh, retired colonel. Uh, he's going to take us back up into the Vietnam War and the Army's senior leadership. He's going to talk about determined to persist, General Earl Wheeler, the Joint Chief of Staff, and the military's foiled pursuit of victory in Vietnam. Uh, almost like a reverse of H.R. McMaster's uh, book on uh, a dereliction of duty, uh, taking their side. So uh, I welcome you back for uh, on April 6th, again at 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, have a great evening. Uh, for those that enjoy basketball, enjoy the next couple weeks uh, where you don't get to sleep. So again, thanks, Tyler. We look forward to you getting back up this way. Thanks so much, Mike. Yep.